Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. One of the most interesting of all of these prima facie duties that Ross is talking about in Chapter 2 of the right and the good is the duty of what he calls self-improvement. And this is one that my students often can both identify with and they also say, oh wait, yeah, I didn't, I didn't think of that. Because they're often in that groove where they, they you know, feel like, yeah, I'm supposed to be improving myself. Often they feel guilty about the fact that they're, they're not measuring up to their own standards. You know, every semester is going to be better and they'll do all the homework you know totally ahead of time and get so much out of it I know what that's like myself having been a student and then it doesn't work out that way but they they don't really think through why is it a duty to improve myself and this kind of goes against some some different ethical you know notions that look so long as you don't actually harm anybody else or fail in your duties to other other people. You can do whatever you want. You don't have to work on yourself, except insofar as not working on yourself makes you kind of the kind of person who might, you know, rob banks or be a jerk to other people or, you know, that sort of sort of failure. Ross says no. You actually do have a duty to improve yourself. Why? He says it arises from the same grounds as the duty of what he calls uh, beneficence. Sorry, I misspelled that for a second. One of the things I should probably work on is spelling. Um, beneficence is doing good to other people. <clears throat> and we acknowledge this as, as a prima facie duty, as something that, you know, there could be overriding circumstances, but in general, if we can do good to other people, we ought to do good to other people. If we can make somebody else's situation better with respect to intrinsic goods or the things that allow us to attain intrinsic goods, then we, we should do so. Well, you're somebody too. You're a person. As a matter of fact, if you want to think about where you can get the biggest bang for your buck, and let's say we're putting aside wealth differentials or things like that. You know, obviously, if you do micro lending, you know, for five bucks, you can help somebody start a, a small business in the third world. And that your money can go a very long way. But you don't have control over that so much as you do over what you do with yourself. Other people can give you all sorts of advice. You can enroll in programs where they tell you you're going to do this, you're going to do that, you're going to do that. Um, you can be placed into situations where people have a you know, regimented routine that's supposed to improve you in one way or another. But that doesn't necessarily work. And one of the reasons why it doesn't necessarily work is because you can always say, I'm not going to do your, your thing. I'm going to do what I want to do to them. You, you control whether you persevere in it or whether you don't. So when it comes to improving your own situation, at least with respect to certain goods, you actually have a lot more control over that than you do in the effects of your beneficence to other people, particularly when it comes to moral virtue and intelligence. I can teach students all I want, you know, and in every class that I teach, some students get way more out of it than I ever thought they would. Um, some students totally surprised me because they started out and I was like, oh, this, is, this, this person's not going to do well. And by the end, they've, you know, through sheer force of effort, 
mastered the material. Some students who I thought were going to do A-OK -okay turn out, you know, because of one thing in their life or another to, to you know, not do well in the class. Um, other students just, you know, sort of are middle of the road. Some students never apply themselves from the start, sometimes never show up. Uh, you know, those are the ones who, you know, they come to class three quarters of the way and you're like, where's your textbook? I don't have a textbook. Well, how did you figure you're going to learn anything? I thought you were just going to teach me. Um, I have some control over what happens in the classroom, but I don't really have much control over who does what with what material, how much they get out of it. Uh, all I can do is sort of prepare the way. But if I decide that I want to learn Mandarin finally, you know, hunker down and, and really learn something beyond 250 characters and some conversational stuff, that's up to me. And I can, I can actually, you know, by making the right choices, by sticking to those choices, make sure that that happens. Now, I may not have the greatest aptitude for that compared to some other people, but if I apply myself, there will be some, some improvement in myself. And Ross says, when we want to think about self-improvement, we want to think about these three main intrinsic goods. Do we have a duty to improve our lives in terms of pleasure? This is an interesting one. This is one um, that, that Ross is actually sort of following along with Kant to a certain degree and then deviating from him. Kant was somebody who was very important in Ross's thinking. And Kant points out, look, we all have an inclination to, to provide ourselves with pleasure anyway. We don't really need to work any harder on making our lives more pleasant in the sense of, you know, like for instance, I love to eat, you know, tasty food and I know how to cook uh, tasty food. Now I could say I'm going to take some cooking classes so I can learn how to make sausages or learn how to really, really make good omelets or... Um, you know, I love pasta dishes. Um, maybe I take a cooking class specifically on that. Do I have a duty to improve my cooking abilities so I can improve my, my eating experiences? Ross would say, come on. No, you don't, you don't have a duty to improve your enjoyment of, of, of cooking. Um, now, you know, what about if I took a class where I actually learned something about the properties of the ingredients and how they fit in with the tastes and it's a little bit more you know um, science based in terms of what's going on with the food. You know, Ross would say yeah okay but now you're talking about intellectual improvement and not just having a better time. And say the same thing about a wine tasting class. Are you taking the wine tasting class because you like drinking wine and rolling it around your tongue and hanging out with other people who, who like to do that and you like getting, you know, getting sloshed because that's what happens after a while if you, <laughs> you swallow, you know, even a little bit of it with, with a lot of wine tasting. Um, or are you actually learning something about the wine? Are you improving your mind and even you're improving your palate, your, your sensitivity, your ability to, to differentiate things? Um, Ross would say those are very different. When it comes to improving our situations with respect to pleasure, Ross would say, really, you don't have much of a duty for that. Now, you might object and say, wait a second, what about the kind of people who characteristically deprive themselves of pleasure, who don't think enough about that, who never really explore anything, and whose lives kind of, you know, kind of suck as, as a as a result, they're, they're unpleasant lives, they're lacking in, in happiness that they could be enjoying. Ross would say that a person like that would, you know, be able to see self-improvement in terms of, of that. Um, that does make sense, you know. Other, another thing that could come up, um, Kant actually brings this up, do you have a duty to pursue your own happiness? Kant says, not really, except if being miserable makes you less likely to actually do the right thing, then yes, you, you do have uh, a requirement to, to provide yourself with enough happiness so that you're not going to be a jerk to people. Um, Anselm actually says something kind of interesting like that about fasting. You know, in, in the Middle Ages, fasting, uh, actually the ancient period as well, 
Fasting was done by many people. It was seen as very important to the monastic life because you need to get control over your, your bodily appetites before you can even start to work on your, on your screwed up personality. And Anselm says, some people really shouldn't fast, which is kind of a strange thing from a guy who did fast a lot and belongs to an institution where fasting is, is very important. And he says, here's why. It, you know, some people are able to fast and they do okay with it and, and other people it just makes them irritable and if it's going to just make you irritable, better to like not be angry at people because anger is worse than, than, you know, not having control over your bodily appetites, he thinks. Better to be irritable or better not to be irritable and, and break the fast, even though it would be good for you to fast. Um, because you're going to be irritable with everybody else, and that's not good for you, and it's not good for them. So that would be a case sort of like what Kant is talking about, what Ross is talking about, where, yes, providing yourself with a certain modicum of pleasure may allow you to actually be a better person, but there we're talking about moral virtue. In that case, the pleasure is a means, not an intrinsic good, but a means to moral virtue. So let's talk now about self-improvement with respect to these other two, intelligence and moral virtue. So I've already mentioned that, you know, I think Ross would be perfectly fine with saying that improving your intelligence doesn't necessarily mean getting yourself a college degree or even, you know, um, some sort of technical degree um, in, in a field. doesn't mean necessarily reading tons and tons of books or listening to them on tape. It means improving your mind more, more broadly, in, even in ways that could connect with the body. You know? So taking uh, uh, wine tasting classes and learning what really goes into a good wine as opposed to bad wines and how to distinguish all the different varietals and some of the history, that would be improving your intellect. Learning a foreign language is, is a way of improving your intellect. Um, doing math problems every day. You know, or doing crossword puzzles. Those would be ways of improving your intellect. Perhaps not as, you know, dramatically as, as going off and getting a PhD and something, but, it, but it's something. It's, it, it is improving oneself, or at least holding things at bay. Because another thing that we need to remember, too, is with intellectual things, although oftentimes we can, we can rely on what we did learn because it's become habitual, and it's become part of our, ourselves. In a lot of cases, it's either use it or lose it. If you don't use it, you're, you're eventually going to lose it. And so we have to fight a kind of battle to maintain what we have. Um, what about moral virtue? Ross says, we actually have a duty to make of ourselves better people than how we have found ourselves. And, along with this, he doesn't spell this out, would go making sure that we don't backslide, making sure that we don't get worse, making sure that we don't give in to temptations that we know we shouldn't give in to, making sure that we don't take those kind of steps where, you know, if you go down, you know, those, those slippery slopes, you go down this way, you're, you're doing a small gesture, but it's going to start leading to bigger and bigger things that establish a kind of moral blindness. Ross thinks that, you know, we actually do have a duty to ourselves because we can benefit ourselves in that way to make ourselves better people morally. So if I have a bad temper, I should work on my temper. If I'm not a generous but a stingy person, I should work on that. If I'm at the other extreme and I'm a spendthrift or a prodigal, and I can't, you know, I can't, I can't keep a, a dollar from burning a hole in my pocket, as they say, I should work on that. If I tend to take more than my fair share, if I tend to conceal the fact that I'm taking more than my fair share, not only from other people but myself, those are things that ought to, you know, be placed front and center for me, and I ought to have some sort of program or intent at least to make make myself better in that respect and why should I do that and partly because it'll make other people's lives better but but not just for that reason because I I ought to be good to myself and to be good to myself sometimes means depriving myself of pleasures 
so that I can become a better off person in terms of intelligence or in terms of moral virtue. Let's think now about some of the other things that we might propose as, as self-improvement that Ross doesn't talk about, which he probably, you know, could have or should have talked about. Let's think about bodily health. Mental health, to a certain extent, might overlap with intelligence and moral virtue, or even, to a certain degree, if it, you know, you're in a, unable to appreciate pleasures, maybe pleasure. Well, let's think about bodily health. Do you have an obligation to maintain bodily health? Ross, I think, would be willing to say yes. First off, you know, instrumentally, there's a lot of things that you're not going to be able to enjoy in terms of these other intrinsic goods if you're not bodily healthy. There's a lot of pleasures uh, that you might be depriving yourself of, uh, usually through indulging yourself in other pleasures. You know, it's enjoyable to exercise once you're actually in shape. Getting there, of course, is kind of painful. And it's laying around and eating, you know, eating too many bonbons or chips or whatever it is that you want, watching TV that uh, tends to make you fat, um, drinking too much, you know, all these sorts of things, portions that are too large. Uh, but that deprives you of certain pleasures. Um, lacking bodily health could interfere with intellectual development and intellectual pursuits might also uh, interfere with the ability to develop moral virtue. Sometimes these could be intrinsically connected. If one of the moral virtues has to do with what we call temperance or moderation of one's bodily appetites for you know, food, drink, sex, rest, all those sorts of things, then indulging yourself to the expense of health would also be indulging yourself with, you know, in relation to moral virtue. Um, but let's put all that in... You know, in all that, that instrumental stuff aside, do you have a duty to keep yourself in good health? Well, think about it in terms of other people. If you were in charge of somebody else, wouldn't one of the things that you ought to do with respect to that person be to, to maintain them in a healthy state? Not necessarily, you know, like, you know, super athlete, but healthy, not overweight, you know, good cardio, cardiovascular, clean, so they don't get diseases, good immune system, all those sorts of things. Is that, is that important? I think most people would say, yeah. You know, if you're responsible for somebody, you probably should make sure that they're, they're eating right, that they're getting exercise. Well, what about you then? You're in charge of yourself. You have a responsibility to yourself, Ross would say, to maintain health. What about making a ton of money? Ross would say, no, there's, there's no intrinsic requirement that you make yourself a ton of money. Uh, money is just a, an, you know, an instrumental good anyway. What about making sure that you're not destitute? What about making sure that you actually have valuable skills that another person might pay for uh, so that you could have the, these other things and so you're not a burden on other people. I think Ross would be receptive to saying that, say, job training could, you know, in order to attain wealth, could in fact be self-improvement. Uh, he'd probably tie that in with moral virtue and intelligence as well. Um, contacts. Your network of contacts. Should you be on LinkedIn? If you're an academic, should you be on academia.edu? Should you have business cards? Are those elements of self-improvement? That's a possibility. You can think of other people as well. Um, sometimes it's difficult to maintain connections, particularly if you move. I know this firsthand with friends and family. If you have them, uh, is there an obligation to yourself to maintain those, those contacts, maintain those support networks as something good for yourself. That's, that's plausible. What about opportunities? Do you have a duty to seek out opportunities for yourself? Or is that something ancillary, something that isn't really a duty, but it'd be nice if you had it.
I think Ross would say that probably depends on the situation. A lot of these are, are fairly situational. But Ross does think that you do, every single one of us, have a duty to ourselves, not to other people, to ourselves of self-improvement. And that it stems from the fact that we are somebody, each one of us, valuable, not just to other people, but intrinsically as a person for ourselves.